Hello, I'm Stephen Fluharty, Dean of Penn Arts and Sciences, and welcome to another installment of What Happens to a Dream Deferred, 60 Second Lectures on Racial Injustice. 60 Second Lectures have been a Penn Arts and Science tradition since 2003, with faculty taking a minute to share their perspectives on a variety of topics. This special series intends to amplify the message of protests around the country and to spotlight the history and contemporary manifestations of racism in the US, black lives and culture, and the range of factors that have contributed to this moment. The series title comes from Langston Hughes's 1951 poem, Harlem, which begins with the question, what happens to a dream deferred? When we consider recent events in our country, we must not think of them as a response to a single incident. They are the response to century of dreams deferred. So now let me introduce today's speakers. First, we'll hear from Dorothy Roberts, the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology, and Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosul Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. Dorothy is also a Professor of Africana Studies and Director of the Program on Race, Science, and Society. Her talk is entitled Racism and the Policing of Black Mothers. Next, we have Dekufu Zubari, the Lazaro Family Professor of Race Relations and Professor of Sociology. He'll discuss being human. Our third speaker is Jolion Thomas, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies. His talk is titled This Isn't for You. Lastly, we'll hear from Quaishon Spencer, the Robert S. Blank Presidential Associate Professor of Philosophy, and he'll speak on the morality of Black American reparations. I'd like to extend my personal thanks to all of today's speakers and everyone who has participated in this very important series. Today marks our last installment of What Happens to a Dream Deferred, 60 Second Lectures on Racial Injustice, but please follow Penn Arts and Sciences on Facebook and Twitter for bonus lectures and other stories from Penn Arts and Sciences. Thank you. Though often left out of discussions about racism and policing, policing black mothers has been crucial to white supremacy in America from the nation's origins to today. Under the system of chattel slavery, black women were commercially valuable to slaveholders for their reproductive labor. White enslavers maintained the racial order and increased their wealth by devising a political apparatus that gave them legal control over black women's childbearing. One of the colony's very first laws, a Virginia statute enacted in 1662, gave children born to enslaved black women who were raped by white men the status of their mothers so the children too could be enslaved. In other words, black women gave birth to enslavable children, even if the fathers were white. The law cast black women's wombs as the producers of their children's subjugated condition, an ideology that still supports racist policies and institutions today. Politicians, researchers, and the media have treated black women's childbearing as an urgent social problem. They routinely circulate stereotypes about black maternal irresponsibility to support birth control, welfare reform, foster care, and law enforcement policies that police and punish black women's childbearing. Thousands of black women across the country were sterilized without their voluntary consent in federally funded welfare programs as late as the 1970s. In the 1980s and 1990s, medicine promoted a now discredited claim that crack cocaine used by black women during pregnancy deprived these women of maternal instinct and caused their babies, labeled with the stigmatizing moniker crack baby, to suffer from uniquely devastating social deficits. Prosecutors charged hundreds of black mothers with fetal crimes and ch child welfare authorities took newborns from thousands more. Then images of the mythical welfare queen fueled Congress's abolition of the entitlement to welfare, allowing states to pass laws aimed at deterring women receiving public assistance from having more babies. 
All these policies make black mothers the scapegoats for social problems caused by structural inequities. Black feminists have been at the forefront of transforming the dominant framework of reproductive choice to one of reproductive justice, which centers the experiences of women of color and places reproductive and parenting rights in their political context of racism, sexism, homophobia, and economic oppression. The fight for reproductive justice for black mothers is an essential part of the broader struggle for racial justice. White supremacy has hijacked the national narrative of the United States. In fact, the same could be said for all of North and South America and Europe. In fact, this misrepresentation of our past distorts what we can do in the future. I ask you to rethink what it means to be human, what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a person in the shadow of these distortions. Beginning in 1988, I've asked this question as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, as a television host on PBS, as a curator of exhibitions and galleries, and as a documentary filmmaker. I do this work to critically engage national narratives. The current broad-based supports against anti-black police terror and the daily insults of white supremacist narratives in museums, monuments, and institutions is un. Precedented. This is the organic conversation by the people for the people. Neither Presidents Clinton, Bush, Obama, or Trump could lead this conversation. The removal of monuments that glorify enslavement and colonization and the calls for the decolonization of institutions like museums, universities, and police are steps in the right direction. What we need to do is ask ourselves, what am I doing to change this narrative of white supremacy? And how am I supporting the efforts against racism and other forms of marginalization that prevent us from being human? This isn't for you. This isn't for you. You know this because on the very first day you set foot on campus as a new professor, the office administrator in the department that hired you treats you as an intruder. This isn't for you because on the day you deliver your first lecture, two black students linger after class to ask you one pointed question. How did you get here? This isn't for you because at the end of every term, at least one student slips you a note saying that your presence in this space makes them feel like they might have a place here too. But this isn't for you. It's not for you because the very university that cuts your paycheck has also cut checks to the Philadelphia Police Foundation. You think of the guns that Penn paid for, and you distinctly remember the feeling of a cop's pistol pressed right against your skull. You will never forget this feeling. In a very real sense, you will never stop being a young black man, unfairly profiled. And that's why you know this isn't for you. You feel it every time you walk by campus and Penn's private police eye you with suspicion. That sculpture on Woodland Walk may say love, but it's very clear that there's no love on campus for the likes of you. And all this is not for you. It is $2 million paid by the university back to the university in a master plan masquerading as public investment. It is nothing compared to the massive property taxes that Penn might have paid directly to you to do with as you would. And let's be clear, this is not for you. It is a brand management strategy. It is a public relations scheme by an institution that wants to get a black talking head in front of an audience to claim that head and whatever ideas might be in it. This is for me, not you. This is for us. The current protests happening all across our country that were set off by George Floyd's extrajudicial police murder are, as the title of these special lectures suggests, a consequence of a dream deferred. But which dream? Some say real police reform. I say reparations. If reparations had been given to black Americans in 1865, or even 1965, 
then George Floyd would probably still be alive today because he probably wouldn't have had any need to use an alleged counterfeit $20 bill. But what's the moral basis for reparations to black Americans? Two philosophers have distinguished themselves by presenting rigorous arguments for the morality of black American reparations. The first comes from Bernard Boxall, who in 1972 published a paper called The Morality of Reparations, and the argument goes something like this. First, all slaves had a moral right to the products of their labor, such as wealth acquired from their inventions and field work. This falls from John Locke's theory of individual property rights. Second, all slave owners stole these products and passed them on to their descendants. This is a matter of historical fact. Third, any stolen products that are passed on to descendants should be returned to the rightful owners insofar as is possible. This is Boxel's reparations principle. Fourth, the rightful owners of the products of slave labor are slave descendants. Since people are already inheriting liabilities, why shouldn't they be allowed to inherit assets? Fifth, it's possible to return products of slave labor. We know this is possible. For example, Georgetown University has owned up to benefiting financially from selling 272 slaves in, in 1838 and has set up a reparations fund to benefit the living descendants of those slaves. Thus, the products of slave labor should be returned to slave descendants. That's one way to defend the morality of black reparations. However, there's some limitations. For one, it only justifies slavery reparations and not any of the reparations eligible injustices against blacks that occurred after slavery, like re-enslavement of blacks using a loophole in the 13th Amendment and vacancy laws, lynchings, unfair inequalities created from Jim Crow laws, racial discrimination in mortgage lending, and so forth. The argument also doesn't apply to groups. This brings us to the next argument which is from Howard McGarry's 1999 book, Race and Social Justice. His argument goes like this. First, groups that received, on the whole, unfair advantages from some institution should return reparative advantages to groups that received, on the whole, unfair disadvantages from that institution. This is McGarry's reparations principle. Second, the group white Americans have received, on the whole, unfair advantages from the institutions of American chattel slavery, Jim Crow laws, anti-black racist school zoning and white flight, anti-black racial discrimination and mortgage lending, and so forth. And the group black Americans have been, on the whole, unfairly disadvantaged by these institutions. These are social facts. Third, some reparative advantages, in this case, are preferential treatment in education and employment such as reparative Department of Education funding for Title I public schools turned into Title I public schools from white flight from court-ordered racial desegregation busing in the 1970s, like the middle school I went to. Thus, white Americans should return at least preferential treatment in education and employment. This is a sample of some of the moral justifications for black American reparations from philosophers. Hopefully, They'll help us to expand our imaginations about which dream was deferred.